Hello, this is Patrick with New Jersey's Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel back here in Assapink Wildlife Management Area. And I met up with Becky and Austin from Life Hypothesis. And about two months ago, we featured their van project about halfway complete. Well, they're back on the channel today and they have finished the van and they're gonna give us a tour inside and out. Hello and welcome back to New Jersey Outdoor Adventures. It's good to be back. Thanks for having us. So we'd like to show you today our completed van build. As Patrick mentioned, we had shown a mid build about 50% of the way through the project on a previous video with New Jersey Outdoor Adventures. And now we're excited to show you what we've done to finish it out. As we go through, we're gonna give you some details on the decisions that we made. A lot of it was budget oriented. So uh, I'd like to mention that we were working with an $8,000 build budget that does not include the cost of the van itself. So first you'll see as we walk in, we have a uh, floor mat right here, which is very handy today. It's a bit sandy um, where we are. And we did cover this floor with a vinyl wood plank look flooring. Um, we have this kind of edge here, which helps us, you know, either finish it off, but also protect the um, most worn area. Uh, and then you can see kind of in here, this is our kitchen. Um, we got all of these cabinet faces actually secondhand from the Habitat for Humanity Restore. We put these handles on here that we just got from Home Depot and uh, used as much space as we possibly could. So these two uh, sink drawer front uh, pop open so that we can put some extra storage in there. So the sink up top here, this was actually another budget find. Um, we scored this for $5 at a garage sale. Um, we're very happy with it. I wanted a really large sink, one that was pretty deep so that we wouldn't have any trouble make, you know, doing dishes or making anything, filling up a pot with water. Uh, you'll notice that we have a really small um, faucet right here. And the reason is because we have a foot pump system. So if you look down below, we have a foot pump, um, which is a dual action whale gusher galley foot pump. That means that on the downstroke and the upstroke, it's pumping water um, and it's just coming up through this small faucet. It's actually a drinking water faucet um, that helps it maintain pressure. If it was a larger faucet, we'd have a little bit more trouble with water pressure. So down here we have four seven gallon containers and we actually have a fifth additional container back in the garage. So that gives us, if I'm doing my math right, 35 total gallons. Now our pumps down here and our uh, the hoses that we use were three quarter inch food grade nylon. For the drain, they actually sell a specific piece that fits onto a standard drain tap, but is designed to go into uh, into a gray water container, kind of like the ones that we have here. We had to do a little bit to modify it to get it to fit exactly right, but they gave, gave us a pretty good basis to work with to get started. So as you can see, three of these containers are for fresh water for drinking and they will be switched out as they run out. And then this back one that has the black tube going to it is our gray water container. Um, that will be emptied every time we switch to a new fresh water container as they have the same capacity. So let's take a look up in the cab for a moment. Not much has changed since our last video. We still have a pretty standard uh, cockpit setup. A little bit of additional information that I added. I also added a, uh, a Bluetooth receiver for those long trips. It's nice to have some tunes. We also ha added a trash bin and recycling bin up front here. They're empty for now. And I wired a standard 120 volt household outlet to our, uh, our inverter and put it up on into this bulkhead wall. Over on this side, I added a K-class fire extinguisher since it's going to be close to our kitchen. A K-class is designed for uh, household fires, specifically grease fires. And I figure it'll work well enough on a diesel fire too. So we kept it up front here. This bulkhead came with the van. We made the, uh, made the front look all nice, but it has a steel frame and I decided to take advantage of that. So I actually countersunk in some neodymium magnets along this length. And that's actually our securing system to keep this door closed. And we also added a, a brush here to uh, a door brush just to keep it sealed, to keep the cold space in the cab separate from the warm space in the living area. So over here we have a, uh, I built a structure uh, out of just a three quarter inch sheet of plywood, which is the same plywood that I used to build the rest of these 
uh, cabinet boxes to make this door into a pocket door. It just adds a little bit of nice bit of finish to it. We have some molding at the top and then a uh, strip of nice wood on the end of it so you don't see the plies of the plywood. Now onto that setup, I'm, we did a pretty typical looking ca uh, counter backsplash, but there is one distinction here. We didn't use tile grout, standard tile grout. The reason being tile grout's rigid. So if the van, when the van moves, it flexes. And if it flexes, regular grout would crack. So this is actually silicone caulk. And it takes, it's a lot harder to do than standard grout, but the results are something that's going to be durable and something that we're able to use in this sort of application. We liked that the color kind of accents with everything else. So this countertop is a concrete look countertop, but it is actually laminate. We got this from Ikea um, and it kind of flows with the stainless steel look that we have going on with the sink as well as our ramblewood cooktop. Uh, the ramblewood is great because it's propane um, and it hooks into our propane system. It has a sparker that works with our electric system so it's plugged in there. Uh, we like this because it's a two burner setup. We can cook pasta and um, an entree at the same time but it also isn't taking up all of our counter space. The overhead cabinets here give us a lot of storage space so let me just give you a peek inside. This one here we're using kind of as our medicine cabinet um, with vitamins and our um, medicines and things like that. Over here we have some toiletries, some microfiber quick dry towels, and then my favorite part personally is the snack area. So you know this is where we're going to keep all of our easy kind of grab and go foods. This is like our breakfast kind of oatmeal with toppings section, um, you know coffee and tea, and then other grabbable snacks. Um, what I love about these is that they go open flush and Austin can tell you how they stay open. So originally we thought we were just going to have standard hinges on there and hold this open while we got inside there. But I think the best $20 or so, $20 that we ever spent were these gas struts that hold the cabinet open so that you can actually get in there with two hands. Definitely worth the money and the install wasn't all that difficult. Just one hinge up here and one down here. We also have come up with a couple different ways to hold fruits and vegetables because uh, as you saw, we're working with a mini fridge that I can show you again a little bit later. So we got this container from Ikea. Actually, let's mention that all these containers are from Ikea, the um, white plastic ones as well. And we have a fruit hammock, which is also from Ikea. Uh, and the idea was to free up the counter space instead of having a fruit bowl that could slide around or um, using inside of the cabinets for perishables, we'd be able to keep them out. They kind of act as decor items as well, um, but we can see what we have and make sure that we use it. One of my other uh, kind of decor pieces was our countertop herb garden. Um, so we have basil and parsley here, and then I'm also a big fan of succulents. So we have a couple of succulents here. We do plan to add more of um, mini succulents that I have to the rest of the van uh, as, as accent pieces. Um, over here, this is where we keep our knives, our um, utensils, any of our serving kind of spatulas and serving spoons. Uh, it's very strong. I think it can carry 15 pounds per square inch. So we don't have to worry about anything coming off of it because it's magnetic. So everything snaps right on. When we drive around, there's no shifting. Things don't go left to right. We don't have to worry about them falling off. Now in here, let me show you. Actually, you can see that this isn't just very straightforward for me to open. I actually have to press down this tab. This is a childproof lock that we're using to make sure that when we're driving, the doors don't fly open on us. Um, and then the drawers, you know, come out and everything in here spills out. So this is our kitchen uh, kind of kitchenwares cabinet. And these, again, are drawers from Ikea. We actually got these secondhand. Uh, and we were able to fit all of our pots and pans, our rice cooker, our blender, um, our electric kettle, toaster, and really the only two bowls slash plates that we have in here uh, on top of our microwave. So 
we decided to bring a microwave because we figured it was one of the easiest ways for us to reheat food. And if we have abundant electrical energy from our solar system, um, we don't have to pay to refill our propane in order to reheat something on the stove, for example. So we like to meal prep. We usually make a meal for four and then we eat two servings and save two servings. So that kind of works well with our lifestyle. So down here we have a, I forget exactly what the size is, something on the it's order like of- a 2.7 cubic. 2.7 cubic. So it's a, it's a pretty sizable dorm fridge. Again, a child lock on here, which is a great way to keep all of this stuff secure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Things shift during transit. Everybody has a tray of uh, old ketchup packets and soy sauce in their fridge somewhere. So, but that's a good lesson in things shifting in transit. Fridge is empty right now. We haven't been living in here all that long, so we haven't had really time to stock it. And there's a little freezer compartment right there. Why did you even put these in here? I don't know, because they were in the fridge. <laughs> it's, like 30, it's like a pound of... Because the soy sauce that we have is like a quart. It's way too big for this fridge. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to clean that up again later when it falls out again. All right, so, so now one thing that I wanted to consider with this refrigerator is this is going to be one of our biggest uh, long-term energy draws on this system. So if we have a series of cloudy days and we don't have a lot of electrical energy coming into our electrical system, I wanted to have the ability to turn off this refrigerator at will. And I did that with a secret rocker switch underneath here. It's kind of hard to see, but if I turn that off, it disconnects the refrigerator from the rest of the electrical system. And we could actually just use it as a cooler. You could throw a bag of ice in there and keep it running that way if we, for some reason, don't have the electrical energy that we need. One more thing I want to mention about the fridge before we move on is you can kind of see this strap snuck out. Um, we have it strapped in around the top and across the bottom. We also built a um, wood framing in the back that holds down the metal piece above or rather below the compressor so that the fridge can't move at all. So when we're in transit, it can only slide about an inch this way, um, but it can't tip over and it can't come out into the living space. Um, and with the combination of the child lock and that, we don't have any issues with our fridge flying across or open while we're moving. The next thing I think we should probably talk about is the cladding. So if you look all around here, you'll see that we have white shiplap on the walls and the ceiling. Um, we also cladded the doors with that. So that was quite the project um, <laughs> to put that all in, but it was definitely worth it in terms of the aesthetic that we were going for. Um, we wanted everything to stay kind of white and light and bright and airy. So we put up the white shiplap. It was pre-primed and it's called nickel gap board. So I think that's because the uh, there's about an eighth of an inch gap there, which you can stick a nickel in. Um, and they keep that consistent gap themselves when you put them up. So one more thing about the shiplap. I was... Uh... This ended up taking a lot of extra time, but I think the result was really worth it. I countersunk each one of these screw holes and pre-drilled each hole, which saved us a lot of time putting it up. And the fasteners that we used to keep it on the wall were self-tapping uh, drywall screws that were designed to be used on aluminum studs. The frame of the van was thin enough that we were able to get through it with those screws. So moving up to the ceiling, and one of the things that I'm actually the most proud of in this van is the lighting system. We uh, we got these adjust dimmable LED lights that are actually run on our remote control or controlled by our remote control over here. There's 10 of them on the ceiling and when they're all on together, they draw somewhere on the order of about 45 or 50 watts. So we have plenty of battery to run that, but I can adjust the brightness here and you know, off and on. Also up there, we have a 32 foot strip of uh, color changing LED lights that just give us a little bit of an accent light. So whatever color we're in the mood for. And behind here, we actually can um, adjust the lighting in the bedroom area separately with a rocker switch that's hidden behind this cabinet. Um, we don't have a remote, but we do just have this light switch that we can turn them on and off to separate those areas. We'll also be installing a curtain that's removable um, just with snaps that can close off this area if someone wants to sleep um, and someone else wants to be using the living space. So here is probably the best deal that we got on this build are uh, $25 a piece junkyard windows, which ended up coming out beautiful after we restored them. Uh, the That collar ended up fitting perfectly with the thickness of the, the 
wall that and the insulation and the wall board that we used behind the backsplash. Now they're not quite done. The one thing that you'll notice that they're missing is we don't actually have curtains yet. And we definitely want curtains in there to block out the light. And in addition to that, I'm at going to tint, I am actually going to tint those windows down to about 5% uh, light transmission, which will make it so that it's a little harder to see in. All right, one thing that I'd like to show you is actually our insulation. We covered this in detail in our 50% mid build video um, that you can find a link to. But in here, we didn't finish putting up the backing on this particular cabinet. You can see this silver is um, polyisocyanurate insulation. It's a foam board. And then um, we covered all of our potential thermal bridges, which are the exposed metal columns that are standard in a cargo van with, these are recycled cooler bags actually that you get when you order from Whole Foods online, um, but it's the same material as Reflectix. So that was something we did to save a little bit of money. Um, another thing you can see here is we did spray foam insulation as well. Um, that's this kind of off-white color to fill any cracks in between the insulation. We did that all 360 around the van um, on the walls. Now on the ceiling and on the floor, we did uh, one and a half inch extruded polystyrene, which is called XPS. It's the pink foam board uh, to create the subfloor. We did a little bit of framing around the outside and then put plywood on top. Uh, in the ceiling, there are struts that go across um, and you can again see that in kind of the mid build video um, where we filled the spaces in between those struts with the foam board. Now underneath the cabinets here, you can see that we installed some under cabinet lighting as well. Uh, this is operated with this black switch here and it just gives you more light that is kind of you know blocked by having these overhead cabinets in this area. So one thing that's I think too often neglected in uh, the van build community, even, even sometimes in professional builds, is your CO2 or CO alarm and smoke detectors and a propane detector if you have the applicable system. So this is just a standard uh, lithium battery smoke detector, uh, you know, 20 bucks on Amazon, definitely worth having. You wouldn't sleep in a room this size without a smoke detector. Why would you sleep in a van without one? We also have our Max fan, which was uh, actually, it was an open box deal on Amazon. So we got it at a discount just because the box was damaged. Uh, it is, multiple speeds and it's actually really quiet even on its uh, highest setting so it's actually pretty comfortable to sleep it's not annoying to sleep in there and we the way we have it set up is we open the windows in the back it pulls air through the van and exhausts it out here so it's like having two separate fans blowing on you when you're back there which is great in the summer it also operates in the rain, which is really nice. So this particular Max Air fan has a rain cover. Um, ours is manual, so you'll notice that there is just a, a knob that we have to rotate in order to open and close here, um, rather than having a remote sensor. But what we actually learned through research is that the remote sensors can be a little bit too sensitive, and at the slightest you know, mention of dew or mist, they will close, and you won't be able to use your fan. Uh, so we actually prefer having the manual option, and it uh, saved us a little bit of money. Now, over here you can see we we have our couch. Um, a lot of people get custom upholstery and things like that. And as we've mentioned before, this was a budget van build. So uh, we wanted to DIY as much as we could, but understand our own limitations. One of those limitations is that upholstering is not our strong suit. And so what we decided to do was to buy these cushions, which this is a five inch um, high density foam cushion, and then buy pre-made uh, elastic covers for them. Uh, this one we cut to size to fit our bench, um, which we can show you in just a second. And then the backing is two separate pieces of three inch high density foam um, that I cut separately on purpose for the reason that we can put one here to have a full length backing. Um, if the door is open, we can put it over on this side so that you kind of have a chaise lounge type feel. Um, now, the nice thing about this is that there's actually storage. So let me show you and lift this up. There's storage inside, um, but you can put a lot of different things in here. So here's a, something that ended up being quite a bit of engineering that uh, turned out really great. I wanted a table that could slide out from here. So I bought some caster wheels that uh, actually hold this plank of wood on the top and bottom. So this is a six foot long 
glued, edge glued piece of pine. And it's three quarters of an inch thick. So it's a good size for a table. It'll come all the way out to here. It's about 48 inches of usable space. But you'll notice it's a little bit floppy. So to solve that problem, I put a drawer slide in next to the refrigerator. So now we have a nice sturdy table that you could use as a desk or we can use for food. I also put magnet, uh, magnetic caches on the back of this and you can see them underneath here that hold the drawer in place when we're moving. This is our pass-through access to the garage. And this tall cabinet here, we have it set up that this top cabinet is actually going to be food storage. We've got another one of these child locks up here because this is going to eventually have shelves with cans in it. So we didn't want anything heavy to be able to push the door open. But yeah, just general food storage, uh, a couple snacks and stuff in there. And down here is a silverware and cooking implement drawer. And this drawer I did custom make, uh, just bought some small drawer slides, uh, 22 inch drawer slides. So it's actually a huge amount of area. It's about four and a half, five inches deep by about 20, uh, 22 inches long. So that's a nice amount of space. And this was actually a bug that turned into a feature. I built it about an eighth of an inch too narrow. So it's really sticky, but that means it just won't open on its own when we're driving. So that ended up being a plus. And down here, we're kind of going to use this as our utility closet per se, a little bit of clothes storage. We might keep a clothes hamper in there. And I flush mounted some of the controls for our electrical system in here. This is the on off switch for the inverter. And then I uh, bought a display that shows the state of charge and the rate of charge for our electrical system. So it shows battery voltage and uh, whether the battery is charging or discharging and how many amps it's charging or discharging. It gives me a good idea of what the solar panels are doing, what the batteries are doing, and do we have enough electricity that we could microwave dinner or do we have to use the propane? So that's, it's useful to have. All right, under here as well is where we have our toilet. So what we would do to access this is basically open the hatch, grab the toilet and pull it into the, the living room area, use it and then return it back to, to where it is. We're going to have a, a strap down system to hold it there. We obviously don't want it moving around in the garage. How this toilet works uh, is that it's a chemical cassette toilet. So this is manufactured by Dometic. It has a five gallon capacity. The nice thing about it, it, it doesn't have anything in it right now, uh, is that there is a fill line so that you know when you need to empty it. In order to empty it, you just separate these two sections from each other uh, and you take the white piece off. The gray piece on the bottom has a tube that can be uh, oriented in any way in order to dump it into a dump station. Um, so it takes liquids and solids you can use um, rv toilet tank chemicals in there to keep the smell down and um, you empty it as soon as it gets full or every five days or so whichever ones comes first uh, and we're going to try not to use this too much to be honest it's kind of a backup um, but we do plan to use public toilets as much as we can or nature if that's a possibility for us so moving on to the bed uh, we have a full-size mattress here. You can see it's oriented long ways. So uh, a lot of people we see orient their mattresses from side to side on the uh, van. However, we're both pretty tall, um, 5'9 and 5'10, and so that wasn't quite enough length for us to lay comfortably. What we decided to do was use this space in order to um, have a lengthwise bed in lieu of perhaps having a shower or something like that inside. Um, what we like about this is that there is a small amount of space um, that you can kind of see right on the side here on each side of the bed. So there's a little bit of storage down there by uh, little storage containers for each of us. Next to the bed, you'll see we have, um, this is a CO detector, uh, separate from our smoke detector. We have it a little bit closer to the sleeping area, uh, as well as over here, there's actually a USB fan um, that can be rotated in any direction. We have it Velcroed to the bottom of our upper cabinets here. So in these cabinets, this is where we store our clothing. So this is my side, this is Austin's side. 
Um, and you can see we're using packing cubes here to keep everything nice and organized. Uh, so there's a cube for shirts and a cube for pants and um, underwear and socks and things like that. Uh, it helps us fit more into this area, but also to know exactly where things are at all times without having to pull everything down. Um, towards the end over there, you'll see that we have book storage. It's what I call a little book nook. Um, and it's by Austin's side of the bed, uh, which you can tell uh, is Austin's because there's overhead cabinets there. There are little black bumpers underneath to prevent him from hitting his head, but I'm very accident prone and would concuss myself if I slept underneath that cabinet. Um, so we put those there for his safety, but I decided that I would have the open side of the bed. Yep. Quick note on the electrical system. This right here is the receiver for the remote control for these overhead lights. And then we have the switch that was mentioned earlier that shuts off and turns on the lights over the bedroom. And actually at the end of the bed over here, we have an outlet that I can show you. Um, the reason we put it right here is because we want it to be accessible from the bed or from the couch. Um, it's essentially centrally located and it's one of, I believe, four outlets that we have. Um, there's one there, there's one in the kitchen for appliances, uh, there's one inside of the cab of the van. Um, I actually lied, there's five. And then on the end of each side of the bed, we have a USB outlet on Austin's side of the bed with two USB ports. On my side of the bed, it's a little bit lower back behind that organizer. There is also a DC plug, um, like a cigarette lighter type outlet with two USBs. Um, the reason we decided to do that is because uh, we have a heated blanket that is 12 volt and uses a DC plug-in and we wanted to use that to be more efficient with our electricity instead of having to invert it to be able to use a 120 volt blanket. And underneath our mattress, we have this flooring that we lay down on the plywood bed platform. Um, this is actually a remnant flooring that we had from um, our parents' home improvement project, rather my in-laws and Austin's parents' home improvement project. Um, we were able to use this flooring uh, to cover the bed platform. We decided to do that because we wanted it to be a good surface for the mattress, as well as we knew we would have visible strips on either side, um, and just to make it cohesive aesthetically with the rest of the design. Um, one more thing about the mattress I wanted to mention is we went with a five inch mattress, um, but you'll notice this is much more than five inches. That's because five inch mattresses are not very comfortable. So we decided, even though we have a relatively tall bed platform, this is, I believe, a 38 inch bed platform, which leaves us about 34, 35 inches above the platform. We decided that we would sacrifice three inches of this space for a really thick um, mattress pad, and that's made it much more comfortable to sleep in here. Uh, so we recommend doing that even if you're gonna lose a little bit of headspace because we really only spend our time, you know, horizontal in the bed. Now Austin is gonna take you around back and show you the garage. Let's go. So in the rear of the van, right here you can see the connecting points for the uh, slick block. The, according to what we found, the weak point for uh, someone trying to break into the sprinter van is actually these rear doors. You can get a crowbar in here and pop, pop the uh, rear latch, the bottom latch fairly easily. So this lock here reinforces it, but the nice thing about it is you don't have to bolt into the metal. It actually uses existing access or existing mounting points. And this is our rear view camera, which actually connects to a display that's also a forward facing dash camera up in the cab. This is actually a security camera as well. It detects motion and records It'll detect motion and detect an impact and save a video uh, in either of those conditions. Let's go inside. So I mounted a, C, a B and C class fire extinguisher, which is for uh, automotive and electrical fires right next to our electrical system. Should we have any problems back here? Now, our electrical system, the basis of it is generally the same as what you saw in the last video. We have a solar charge controller over here a 12 or a 15 amp battery charger that plugs in to a uh, regular 120 volt outlet. Here's the plug for that. So that would, that's fast enough to fully charge this battery bank over about eight to 10 hours or overnight at a campsite. Over here's our DC distribution. It's a little bit of a mess of wires right now, but I actually, uh, I labeled all of the different places where it goes. Down here is our uh, negative 
DC bar. And this is our 2000 watt monster inverter, big enough to run a microwave. The DC to DC battery charger that uses the vehicle's alternator to uh, charge the battery. So there's three different ways to charge up here. And then you have the AC and the DC output. Inside this box, this box is sealed and it has a computer fan putting uh, positive pressure in on that side and a tube here where the uh, any gases that might build up, potentially hydrogen sulfide or hydrogen gas that could be explosive or toxic, builds up inside uh, from charging the batteries, that fan forces air out this tube and then out the taillight. So one thing that I did, did want to make a note of is that this is a nylon tube and the nylon, that's the best material I could find that wouldn't react with the hydrogen sulfide, but over time this will eventually decay. The same thing for this nylon strap. So they're actually going to be replaceable parts eventually. So here's the mounting points and rollers for the table. So I built these actually out of some nice pieces of oak because I wanted them to be as rigid as possible. Actually, it was really nice working with something other than pine, uh, pine two by fours. So there's two nylon rollers on the bottom and one on the top. And then there's another truck over here with the same thing. And that allows you to uh, get a nice smooth rolling action on the table. I repurposed the, uh, the, the cab lights that were already in the van, kind of tough to see from your angle, but wired up to this switch right here. So why you, you know why buy something new when you can use something that you already have? So it's definitely a bad idea to store a propane cylinder in a closed vehicle. Even if the propane cylinder itself is uh, turned off, it can still experience changes in pressure or changes in temperature that'll uh, vent the propane tank. So I built a box, a sealed box with a vent going out the bottom of the van to keep my propane tank in. I've used some buckles. And in here, I'm weather stripping around this lid. So if that propane tank vents, it'll just vent out the bottom of the van harmlessly. Uh, the best I could find for, the, I found a, uh, some sort of marine guideline for having a propane tank in a boat. And they said that you should use three quarter inch, uh, a three quarter inch tube at least to vent. So that's what I ended up using. From that propane box, I routed these, uh, the line all the way around over my table and over here to my propane distribution. So there's the high pressure line coming from the tank goes to this, uh, this propane connector that actually has a nice little valve, kind of a dummy valve or dummy gauge on it that shows basically whether or not there is propane pressure. Kind of has a green, yellow, and red arc, but no actual numbers on it. It's kind of handy though, and it glows in the dark, which is nice. On this side, the valve that's shut off right now, there's a tube that's meant to imitate the connector on a uh, on those mini one pound camping uh, green propane bottles. And that is designed to connect up to our Mr. Buddy heater. I wouldn't recommend using it in an enclosed space without a uh, carbon monoxide detector and a propane detector in, in the event of a leak. Now the other side, I ran it through a regulator that brings the pressure down to about half a PSI. And that's the amount of pressure that you need for a household cooktop, which you, uh, you can use a regular cooktop. Most of them come with some sort of adapter that allows you to convert, uh, to use uh, propane in the place of natural gas that you would get in a household. So that's what this silver hose is running around here that goes up to the uh, propane stove in the kitchen. Thank you for coming back on the channel to show us your completed project. What's next for you guys? So our plan is actually to be leaving within a week and we want to see all of the national parks in the lower 48 United States. Um, we'll be traveling for about 10 months and um, we're hoping to stop along the way to visit and see family and friends throughout the, uh, the lower 48 and really get an opportunity to spend time in beautiful natural places. Uh, I personally want to work on my photography um, and really just take some time off and relax. Yeah, it's going to be nice to get away from everything for a little bit. In your build, you had a very strict budget that you were trying to fit within. Is there a next budget for like travel plans? Because I know that's your you specialize in. Yeah, we do have the the uh, we definitely have the the trip itself budgeted out. 
in detail month by month yeah so well as patrick mentioned that's kind of my thing um i'm a money coach and i'm very uh interested in finances and and money and how to use your money to create a freedom lifestyle and so one of our goals with the van build was to uh basically build an affordable home um but another thing was to make it a way that we could travel the United States on a shoestring budget. So we've estimated that our budget would be about $2,300 a month um, at most for two people to travel in the van. Um, and that includes like fun stuff. So if for some reason we want to be saving more money a certain month, we can not go out for drinks or for food in a restaurant and, and kind of reel in the budget that way. Um, but we saved all of our money for this project ahead of time. Um, so we actually were planning to build a tiny house this year and 2020 kind of threw us a curveball. Uh, so we took the money that we saved for that tiny house and we put some of it into the van build. Um, and then we're going to put some of it towards the trip as well. Now is there any tips that you could give our viewers of some of the hurdles you might have had to overcome to build a van like this? Well one thing that really got me is the van build was in three stages so psychologically. It was the first 10 percent, the second 80 percent, and then the last 10 percent both felt like even thirds. We were a month into this build and if somebody didn't know, if somebody just walked up and looked at the van, they would have thought, hey, when are you gonna get started on this thing? Even though we'd had done so much prep work, but the, the key is really in the prep work and getting everything set up so that you have a, a solid platform to build on. The little details, uh, building a solid base so that I can screw my cabinets down to that, so that I can get a nice backsplash on those cabinets, everything built on top of everything else. But just, uh, and then on the other end, We've been working on, this van has been, what I would say, almost finished for about four or five weeks now. It's been not substantially different from this, but all that little detailed work adds up and it makes a really big difference. So follow through, because that's the hardest part. It, it does start to drag on. I bet your budget is a big thing with that. I see a lot of builds on the Facebook marketplace that are halfway done or almost done, but they ran out of money or they change jobs so I guess really sticking to your budget is important because you don't want to go over then you, you just can't finish it yeah and I think it's hard to know where you are with your budget and how it relates to your build if you're not tracking what you're spending so it can sound tedious you know if you're thinking I have to keep track of every dollar I spend but what we found really useful was tracking how far we were with the tasks that we knew that we needed to get done in the van build and how far we were with our budget so if we were 50% done with the tasks and 50% done with the budget, which is where we were at the last video that we shot with you, then we were good. We were on track. But if we were 80% done with our budget when we were only 50% done with the build, that would be concerning unless we had pre-purchased a lot of our items. So, um, like we mentioned, we had an $8,000 budget for this build. And as of right now, like I said, we're about a week from leaving. Uh, we're under budget by a couple of hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we want to splash out and splurge and, and get something that maybe we thought, oh, we'll get that later, or maybe we won't get it at all, um, that could be an option for us. Or we could just put that into our van life budget instead of our van build budget. Um, but either way, we were careful to, to make sure that our budget matched our pace and we weren't um, overspending. And as we went through this build, I kind of pointed out what different things cost and how we saved money. Um, but we found it was important to make sure that we were focused on like the overall build and what we wanted to get out of it, where little details um, made a difference. We could find ways to get them for less expensive or, or um, secondhand instead of buying something brand new. And that would help us get to the end of our vision instead of having a halfway finished product that had exactly what we wanted mm -hmm. in it. And I know off camera, we talked a little bit about timeline. I know you had a, a certain time frame you were trying to finish in it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, a Gantt chart is definitely your friend in this case. This It makes us sound really nerdy to talk about it yeah. like this, but um, we were both project managers. He's an engineer. Um, I'm a scientist and um, I used to manage projects. Now I like managing money. So the way that we approached this was uh, 
kind of like you would manage any project that has a timeline, um, it has labor needs, and it has financial needs. Uh, and what I definitely recommend to someone who maybe hasn't managed projects before in, in a business sense is to double your timeline that you, so, so do your research and come up with a timeline. And um, our timeline we said was gonna be 10 weeks <laughs> for a full-time build. Um, we ended up at 16 weeks. So that wasn't quite double, um, but if we had planned for a 20 week build, we would have come out ahead and, and felt um, much happier probably at the 80% point than we did at our 80% point when we were losing motivation because we, we were already four weeks over our build timeline that we had hoped for. Um, so that's something that we knew about and we, we still made that mistake. Uh, and then the same thing for the budget is do your research and see what other people do their budgets for. But I would say um, if you think you know what your budget is going to be, unless you've itemized what each of those costs are, you probably want to double the budget as well. Yeah. So you've probably never built a van before. I haven't either. Yeah. <laughs> so the fact of the matter is, I don't know how long any of these things are going to take. I didn't, I've never built a cabinet before. I didn't know if that was going to take a day, a week, or several weeks. So having giving yourself a budget but or a time a timetable, a time budget, but being flexible and forgiving yourself when the cladding takes two weeks or the insulation takes two weeks when you yeah. thought that we could knock that out in an afternoon, that's that's going to be the key to actually succeeding in a van build like this. And you mentioned full-time build. So this wasn't something you did uh, oh, nights yeah. and, and weekends. This was right. a this was a full-time job. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Our first four weeks were part-time. Um, and then after that, we went full-time. So, uh, I mean, we're talking most days were eight hours and we didn't take weekends mm -hmm. off. Eight um, hours. A 16-hour day was not unheard of yeah, uh, as a of lot of this. Yesterday, which is when we considered the build, done except for minor details um we had spent about a thousand twenty five hours uh, between the two of us on the build mm -hmm. and that was in a period of 16 weeks so you know you're it, it depends on what your goals are right and what your your limitations are um you're not necessarily going to be able to do it as quickly as we did but you might be able to do it faster i mean i've seen people do builds in 30 days and there are only two people working full time so skill level matters um past experience matters uh, the constrictions that you have around your work schedule if you can work full time weather you know we started to get cold weather we started to get snow um we were actually really really lucky to have a very warm october which was the the meat of our build was in October. Um, but there are all sorts of things that are hard to account for. And so that's that's one of the reasons I recommend doubling your build timeline, because it, it can be difficult to um, anticipate all of the things that would affect how long it takes. A lot of people don't realize uh, there's about a 300 human hours in a manufacture production camper van conversion. Mm -hmm. and, and that adds to the price. That's why they cost what they cost. You were able to save a lot of money building one on your own, but then your labor obviously was higher because this was new. This is your first yeah. time. You had yeah. a lot of discovery to make. Mm -hmm. How are our viewers going to be able to find you and follow your journeys out on the road? So you can follow us on Instagram is our primary platform. We are at Lifepothesis. It's kind of hard to get from me saying it, but here's the spelling of it. Um, and you can find links to all of our other social media and our website there, but that's www.lifepothesis.com. Um, we also have a YouTube channel that will be linked in the description. And um, we'd be really happy to connect with you and for you to follow along with our journeys. Uh, we still have so much um, documentation from the van build that we're hoping to share. We, we have videoed all of the parts of our process and um, I've written some blog posts on how we were able to save um, so much money on the build and do what, what we call the budget luxury um, mm -hmm. build where we wanted it to look luxury, but do it on a smaller budget. Well, thank you guys for taking the time again to give our viewers a tour of your absolutely beautiful and stunning camper van conversion. This is Patrick with New Jersey's Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel. Hope you like this video. Please comment, subscribe, share. We love it. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.